Well, hello everyone. Um, we'll wait for a couple of uh, seconds for people to uh, join on, but I'm gonna put that kind of in the uh, background. And there is Vance. Perfect. All right, Vance, we're gonna uh, take a minute for uh, people to start uh, checking on. Hello, my name's William Davis. I am the Director of Education for Wilson Daniels, and welcome to this latest installment of IG Live, uh, where we're going to uh, talk to Vance Rose, the winemaker of Rootstock, which is a personal endeavor of Wilson Daniels. So, um, with the wines being focused in the United States, uh, this is something that we believe in right varietal, uh, right appellation, and right winemaker. So who better to have leading the charge uh, than Vance? So I'm going to uh, bring him on in just a moment. Um, if you do happen to have any questions, uh, feel free to, you know, uh, connect, uh, you know, uh, send something in on the comments and we will, uh, we will do whatever we can to get those uh, questions asked uh, of Vance. And he is actually in the uh, uh, the vineyards with us today. So, with that in mind, so he is in uh, currently in one of our Chardonnay vineyards. Hey, Vance, how are you? Good, William. Happy to be with you today. Uh, the pleasure is all mine, my friend. So, uh, you know, uh, hopefully you're not sweating out there. I know that uh, you know you had a heat wave a little earlier on this week in 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 the North Coast and Napa specifically. But I think you told me, judging by behind you, it looks like a beautiful day to walk around it's, the vineyard. It's a beautiful day here. I'm in the Carneros uh, area, uh, just on the Sonoma County side in one of our Chardonnay uh, vineyards for rootstock, just south of the town of, of Sonoma uh, and just to the, to the uh, west of the Napa County line by about a mile and a half or so, and the sun came out about three minutes ago. So it's perfect for our, for our chat today. And uh, the vineyard is uh, it's looking good. I'm happy with, with what I see out here. Well, wonderful. And you know, I think that's something to be said of Carneros, right? You know, you, you're, you're really not gonna see that sunlight until you know, the, the, the late morning or early afternoon, which makes it such a wonderful place to grow great varieties like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Yeah, it's uh, just over my shoulder, probably from where I'm standing, is about two to two and a quarter miles to San Pablo Bay. San Pablo Bay, during the course of the growing season, is about 56, 57 degrees in temperature. And that really moderates the area immediately around it, which is what Carneros is. And so that it brings fog in, mostly from uh, the Pacific coast, but also up from San Pablo Bay, and that's what's just breaking now as the sun is beginning to, to come out. But even during the course of the day, that bay temperature moderates what we have here. So it keeps the acidities higher and brighter for things like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, as you said, William. <laughs> well, great. So, you know, you've been uh, a winemaker now at Rootstock for what, five, six years now. Um, and we've, I've seen personally so many changes in the, uh, in, in the approach to how the wines are made, all for the better. Uh, I think that you've done an amazing job. Uh, but for everyone out there, give them a little bit of background on you, because it's a fascinating story. Well, I appreciate you saying kind things about me, William. But it, uh, it's interesting, because I have a unique perspective to, to bring to Rootstock both as winemaker uh, and also for finding the vineyards that, that we work with. I really do kind of three things for money in the world. Uh, winemaking, number one. Uh, I'm a chef also uh, professionally and I work in the cork business. And in that cork business, we sell to about 17, 1800 wineries around North America and about four or 500 in Napa and Sonoma. So through that, I have a lot of connections <clears throat> out in the, the winery world and vineyard world. And so it's, it is much easier for me to, to go out and talk to these people about buying fruit from them and working very closely with them 
all through the season than, you know, just a winemaker that sits in the winery and turns the grapes into, uh, into juice and, and hope it tastes good. So from a sourcing standpoint, it really helps us as a brand uh, to, to do that. We work with a number of growers between our different varietals and uh, that finding the, the right vineyards in the right uh, uh, viticultural areas is extremely important. The other thing, being a chef, is it gives me a unique perspective on how to turn a raw ingredient into something very, very flavorful. And that's what we're doing in winemaking is turning a grape, the raw ingredient, into something flavorful. <laughs> and to do that with food uh, is you got to get the best tasting ingredients you can. And to do that in winemaking, you have to get the best tasting grapes that you can. And that's what I work on every day. That's what I work with uh, with our growers to grow the best possible fruit that we can. That's other than this event. That's why I'm also in the, in the vineyard uh, this morning. No, I, I, I love seeing this. And, and, you know, something about being, you know, uh, you know, enclosed and, you know, the shelter in place just to see a vineyard and for ha having someone walk through it's it's living vicariously through you. So, you know, we can't thank you enough and we can't thank the cell phone reception enough. Um, so, you know, with you being into in, in the uh, Chardonnay Vineyard, give us a little insight into, you know, not only, you know, you talked about how you approach uh, the, um, uh, the, the winemaking philosophy, but what are you doing in terms of aging that some other, you know, uh, you know what we call uh, uh, fruit source based wineries are, are not doing? Well, we really, on every one of our wines, we treat these wines like any other very expensive uh, Napa Valley Cabernet or Carnero Chardonnay. We're not taking any shortcuts in, in what we're doing. Standing here talking about, about Chardonnay uh, is, you know, I work with this, with this same grower here uh, 12 months out of the year to grow the best possible fruit and then we bring it to the winery and we have a very gentle crush into tank, uh, settle, and then we ferment partially in stainless steel and partially in neutral French oak barrels. And then once the, the wine has finished the primary fermentation, all of it is then aged in, uh, in barrel. Every one of our wines is aged in barrel. So there is no shortcut uh, uh, do it in tank, churn and burn, cash flow winemaking here. There, uh, we don't chip any of these wines in tank. And and the advantage that that, that gives us is uh, a stainless steel tank is inert and it doesn't allow any air into the wine. And wine needs oxygen. Too much of it and it will spoil the wine, but too little of it then the wine won't have what we call oxidative strength. And what that means is the wine won't be able to fight off oxygen uh, as it ages. And so those wines that are done in stainless steel, they don't have uh, any great ageability. And that, that oxygen that we get from a barrel uh, allows the wine to lengthen out and have a greater uh, longer uh, finish to it. And so it's really important to have oak aging. I don't love uh, the, the single undisputed character of oak in any of my wines. And so I want that, uh, I want that oxidative character in the wine, but I don't want the first thing you smell when you, when you bring that glass to your nose to be oak. I don't want it to be any of the other elements in the wine either. I want all of those elements to be in there in harmony, together, working together. Uh, and I certainly don't want oak to stand out, but oak does play a very important role in uh, our winemaking and wine aging process. And that's very different from what you're gonna see in wines uh, that are at our price point out there in the market, William. No, I, I agree. And I think that, you know, that speaks to a little bit of your background and still and, and that focus in being a chef and why it's been so successful in restaurants that have supported, you know, not only the Chardonnay, but the other wines in the rootstock portfolio 
over the years. And what I, one thing I've always enjoyed about your wines is that they do have, you know, I always talk about tension. I talk about freshness. And that's something that we don't necessarily get a chance to talk about, especially with New World wines. Um, and for, you know, a wine that, you know, is more in this by the glass uh, kind of scenario, the fact that the wines do age pretty well and they've, they've had a chance to oxidize, for anyone that's in the restaurant business and that's bought wines, you know that you need that bottle of wine to last for 24 to 36 hours. It cannot be an inferior product that when you pop the cork, you're waiting until the end of the shift before you just dump it down the drain or use it for a cooking wine. And the, the other problem with that is not only uh, the waste, but those wines don't have that, that, that tension that you described. It, they don't have the acidity that keeps the wines savory. And uh, that's one of the things that I really like in wine. It, one is balance and the other is brightness and, and acidity. And I think that's what wine needs to be to a to go with food but i also think to drink it by itself it needs that because that's what makes it fresh and uh, invigorating and wants you and brings you back for that next sip that next glass and hopefully you know depending on the night the next bottle but that that energy and that that acidity that verb is is extremely important and it's one of the things that you know people talk about a lot with Chardonnay, they talk about it with Pinot Noir, they talk about it with Sauvignon Blanc, but rarely do you ever hear the word acidity mentioned with Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. And that's one of the things I think you'll find in the rootstock Cabernet is it has a brightness, it has some acidity, which makes it more savory, which brings you back for the, the next sip and the next glass. And I think it it drinks better on its own that way. And I think it goes better with, with food because of that, that acidity. And that's, as I say, something pretty rare to talk about with, with Cabernet, unfortunately, because I think that needs to be talked about with, with every wine, William. True. And so, you know, we didn't get really get a chance to talk about Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and that is actually, in many ways, where our relationship with you started. Um, what are the things that you love about Sauvignon Blanc in Napa Valley, uh, and specifically with the uh, rootstock Sauvignon Blanc? This wine is really a dream wine for me. I love making Sauvignon Blanc. And, and one of the, the really great reasons is because out here in the vineyard, when uh, as the season progresses and we get into August and maybe even early September, you can come to the vineyard and, and taste that fruit. And it is the only grape varietal that I've ever worked with that then that resulting wine, you know, two months, six months, 10 months later, tastes exactly like that grape. And so what I try to do is not manipulate those grapes and make them be something they don't want to be. It's like a, a kid that you have and that kid is, is five foot six and slow, you're probably not going to make him an NBA basketball player. And if that kid can't carry a note, uh, can't sing, you're probably not going to make him a musician. You got to let that kid be what it wants to be. And I want to let those grapes be what those grapes want to be. So I allow them to do their thing. We generally uh, try to do a natural yeast fermentation uh, because that brings the character of that vineyard with it uh, into the winery. Uh, we, we do some of Sauvignon Blanc in ferment in stainless steel. We ferment some in concrete egg. Uh, and we ferment some in uh, neutral French oak barrels. And then we, we age primarily in a uh, barrel and a little concrete egg. And even sometimes a little stainless steel and that gives us a variety of oxidative levels the the concrete egg uh, more oxygen than a stainless steel tank but less than a barrel uh, and none of the oak flavor so it really helps uh, us create that palette also the other interesting thing about Sauvignon Blanc is is with it about 65 or 70 percent of what you're going to get in that wine is done in the vineyard 
Uh, and as a winemaker, I can't manipulate it and force it into being something else. Whereas, you know, it's, it's red cousin, say Cabernet Sauvignon, it's about 30, 35% done in the vineyard and the rest in the winery as a winemaker. So with Sauvignon Blanc, William, I get to be a bit lazy and, <laughs> and uh, have the vineyard do all the work. Well, nothing wrong with that. And, and again, utilizing concrete, using stainless and, and, and oak at a price point. And, and that's what amazes me about this wine is that for, you know, a wine that you could easily serve by the glass for less than $15, uh, it is a phenomenal offering uh, compared to some of the other recipes. And you talk about being in the vineyard uh, for Sauvignon Blanc. Are you using a blend of different clonal selections? Uh, are there some favorites that you have? Uh, what do those uh, bring to the table? Well, in all four of our wines, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Sauvignon Blanc, we use a mix of clones. And it's not something you see a lot on wine labels. Uh, it's not uh, something you, you really almost ever see in, uh, in wine reviewing, but every different grape varietal has a number of different clones. Uh, and those clones remarkably have very different characters. Uh, in Chardonnay, we primarily use uh, Dijon uh, clone from France and Winte clone from California. Uh, and those are two of my favorite clones. Uh, and they definitely have different characters. And, and I believe that the wine is better with a mix of those characters than just one or just the other. I think it adds a great deal of complexity. And we do that with all four of, of our varietals. And it is extremely important uh, how that, uh, you know, how that clonal mix gets worked in. I think it's probably as important uh, as almost anything in our Pinot Noir. That's really one of the primary uh, things that we work on uh, with our Pinot Noir is that complexity by blending different, different clones together. No, that's, uh, that's great. And, you know, uh, nice shout out to uh, Todd. Uh, you know, you got Lipman and Salvatore that, you know, have poured these uh, wines in the past uh, in their establishments. So let's talk a little bit about Pinot Noir. Um, so uh, this is a relatively new uh, addition to the rootstock portfolio. For years, we had the Willamette Valley, uh, which we are phasing out of. And um, I think, Vance, you have taken uh, our understanding of Pinot Noir in California uh, to another level. So give us a little insight in you know, some of the fruit sources, you know, uh, some of the relationships that you've built you know, with these specific plots. Well, Pinot Noir is a great love of mine. The first uh, great wine that I ever had was a, a wonderful French red Burgundy. Uh, I have pursued that, that wine from a consumer standpoint for, for years and years and years. And what we're trying to do with this rootstock Pinot Noir is not make Burgundy because we are in California. It's going to, to be different. But the first decision that we made was to make this wine from vineyards in the Sonoma Coast. Sonoma Coast is a relatively big appellation that stretches all the way from Carneros in the south to the Mendocino County line in the north, basically hugging the coast. And that ocean is what keeps it cool, uh, and that's what retains that acidity and freshness. Pinot Noir, as I said, is, a, uh, is very important to work with the clonal selections. It's a thin skin grape. That's why it has less color than, than Cabernet Sauvignon or, or other red uh, varietals. And it's finicky and it needs to be grown in the right areas. And so I chose Sonoma Coast because I believe that's the best area in the United States to grow Pinot Noir. And because of its size, we work with two different growers. One grower in the southern end of that, actually from where I'm standing in this Chardonnay vineyard, it's probably two miles uh, as the crow flies from here to that southern uh, vineyard. And then we work with one much further north. It's uh, in Sonoma County, obviously, because it's in the Sonoma Coast uh, AVA, but it's about four hour drive from my house to that that vineyard and it wow. is 
in what we call the true Sonoma Coast. It's uh, right at about a thousand feet in elevation, about a mile and a half inland from the Pacific. And why that's important is that the fog there every morning is about a thousand feet in elevation. And so this vineyard being just above that, it stays sunny most of the day. Uh, so those vines can, those leaves can absorb the sun rays and photosynthesize and drive ripeness and growth into the vine and into the, the grape cluster, but not be hot and warm because the hotter you grow Pinot Noir, the, the more generic red wine it takes. And so you really need to keep it cool. And we then use a, a blend of clones, both of these vineyards, we use, uh, we have two different clones in and we, we work with them to get the percentages that we want. And then the last little bit on, on Pinot Noir in terms of winemaking is um, we do blend a little bit of whole cluster uh, of stems into our fermentation, which keeps the wine from being too overtly fruity, too mm. strawberry, raspberry dominated. As I said, I don't want any one element on any of these wines to, to dominate. And I think there's too many California Pinot Noirs that are dominated by that sweet uh, fruit. And, and I think there needs to be more than just that in California Pinot Noir. And so I use about, depending on the vintage, maybe between 10, 15, occasionally up to, to 20% uh, of stems in whole clusters to, uh, to tone down that fruit that fruity, overtly fruity character uh, of the wine. No, it's, uh, and you know, I have to, I have to thank you for making that four hour drive to some of these remote vineyards because most people aren't doing that. Most winemakers aren't necessarily doing that um, for wines at this price point. Uh, they may have, you know, um, a vineyard manager that might report to them, but being able to touch that fruit, how often, you know, Alexa had, had asked this question, how often, do you get a chance to go out to the vineyards? I know you had mentioned um, the Chardonnay vineyard that you're currently in, um, but how, how often are you making out to these vineyards either during the growing season or, or when the vines are dormant? Well, it, it's interesting because that you bring up the dormancy and the growing season because most people think a, a grape just starts at the begin in spring uh, in the growing season at bud break. And that is not true. Uh, those grapes were set into that vine at the end of the last growing season. And they were in there and bud break just brings them out. So they're not forming in spring, they're forming the previous fall. And so, you know, I work with these growers through the end of harvest and then very quickly, I'm back out in those vineyards, making sure we're doing the right things to set that fruit uh, for the next vintage. And then from a, from a vineyard standpoint, there's not a lot uh, going on except for making the decision of when to prune. Uh, and then once we, just before bud break, and from now really through uh, the end of harvest, I tried to, to be in every vineyard uh, at least once every two weeks. Uh, there's a lot going on. It tells me a lot what the vines need. And I'll try to do this now for you. William, sure. uh, I'm not the greatest cameraman. That is not one of my uh, one of my skills. But we're here in in this Chardonnay vineyard, and you can see hopefully a little Chardonnay cluster there. And uh, yes. so that these these shoots, you can kind of see uh, the base of the vine, the cordon here, the shoot that's coming up, and then these little clusters. And so at this time of year. It's extremely important to watch that because we've had this bud break. The vine went from totally dormant to growing this shoot. And in this vineyard, these shoots are between about eight and 12 inches long at this point in time. I'll show you again, kind of, there's the, the green, darker leaves that are bigger. You go up to uh, kind of a lighter green. And then the new growth is almost white uh, with the tiniest bit of green uh, in there. And that is, showing the new growth of that vine. The next step, which should happen in the next few weeks, 
particularly here in Carneros for Chardonnay, is these grape vines, these great the grape clusters will flower. And it is a process that takes about two weeks. Grape vines are self-pollinating, so we don't need bees or anything else to come pollinate it. But we need that flowering period, that two weeks, to, to be relatively calm uh, so that those grape clusters will pollinate properly. And so we don't want too much heat. We don't want too much excessive wind. We don't want excessive rain. And fortunately for us, the, the weather forecast for the next two to three weeks is very, very good. There uh, is nothing in there uh, that uh, worries me about flowering. So I'm always uh, nervous to uh, get that going. Frost is also an issue at this time of year. And so we work very hard to make sure that isn't happening. Uh, this vineyard that we're in had about 2% of frost bite, frost damage in one little low corner of it about three weeks ago. Okay. Uh, but we haven't had any frost danger since then and nothing looked like, uh, looks like that it's on the horizon. And hopefully, you know, in Carneros, we always think of May 1st being the the time after which we won't have frost. Uh, that's not 100% accurate, but but we always feel a lot better when we get to May 1st. So I think we'll make it through the next couple of days and get there, William. Good. Yeah, because, I mean, that was a question that just came through, you know, in terms of frost and specifically shatter. You know, how are you working with uh, the growers to combat some of those uh, conditions? You know, I, I would imagine that you're working with uh, growers that have a lot of experience in, in dealing with this. Um, do you have uh, any input or is it uh, um, you know, really having them, you know, just, uh, you know, pay attention and you, uh, you, you're making a phone call as, as you, you know, check out the uh, weather forecasts? The, the good news for me is that there is an alarm in each one of these vineyards that goes off as the temperature dips. Uh, and as I said, the good news is that alarm is not at my house. It's at the vineyard owner's house. And so they're the ones that get up at four in the morning and, and start to do the frost preventative uh, uh, measures. But uh, I know about it generally prior to that happening or the, the possibility that that could be happening. And so uh, I'm not there at four in the morning usually, but try to get there by seven you know, 637, 715 to see, you know, that it is mitigating, that it isn't a problem, uh, you know, where the problems are. And we use generally two different things to mitigate frost damage. One is, is wind. Uh, we have big helicopter propellers in the vineyards and that uh, just inverts the cold air, which cold air sinks. And so it gets down to, to the ground uh, which, you know, the grapes are not but about three and a half feet off of, of the ground. So, so we just use the fans to invert that warmer air down to where the colder air was, and it keeps them from getting frost. And in a few vineyards, we use sprinklers. And I know this is counterintuitive, but what we do is put a thin bit of water out all over the vine and all over that grape cluster. And that water freezes. And you think, oh my gosh, you're freezing that grape cluster. But the uh, kinetic energy is working outwards to freeze and not coming into the grape and freezing it on the inside. So then once the temperature gets above freezing, that outer uh, frost layer melts and that, that the leaves of the vine and the grape clusters never freeze and they're healthy. So we use both of those methods in our different vineyards for uh, frost prevention. So uh, hopefully it, uh, you know, we're, we're just about out of that, that danger. I think really for all of our vineyards in about the next week, we should be, should be out of that. Then we'll get through flowering. Uh, and so far, it really looks to be the start uh, of a good year. Once, once we get through that flowering process, then we'll have an idea of how much crop we have and, and, and what it's doing. But uh, for, you know, people like you and I who've been sheltering in place and social distancing, our uh, grapevine friend here 
uh, has not. Those, uh, those grapes have really been looking good and are ready to make some beautiful 2020 Chardonnay, which as you said, this uh, will be my seventh vintage as the rootstock winemaker. And I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be an exciting year, William. No, thank you. It's, um, you know, we didn't get a chance to, you know, talk about some of the press and the accolades that you've received over this very short time of working uh, with Rootstock. You know, the, uh, the Pinot Noir just received a top 100 from Wine Spectator, and that's the second time that you've uh, uh, been awarded uh, such, a, su such an accolade. Uh, yeah, what... it's, uh, I normally try not to pay a lot of attention to, to press because it's, you know, it's hit or miss. It is uh, one person generally weighing in uh, on your wine. It definitely can help sell wine, but it's not, that's not what I'm making wine to do. I'm not making wine for someone writing about it to love. I'm making wine for someone sitting in a restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, that has it by the glass or by the bottle and I want that person to love that wine. That's really who I'm making it for. But if there is one thing that, that I do like is that spectator top 100 list. It's kind of like the Academy Awards. And, and uh, I was, when, when the uh, Rootstock 2017 Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir was honored this year at number 66, I had to laugh quite a bit. Uh, my wife and I were, we're talking about it. And she said, Oh, that is so great. Congratulations. And I said, Yeah, you know, it's fantastic. 18 years ago, I was number 68. Now, 18 years later, I've moved up to number 66. So at this pace, I'll need to be wait making wine for about 400 more years to get up to number one. So <laughs> I, I have been doing my best social distancing so that I can stay healthy, live to 400 and make it all the way to the top of that list, William. Well, uh, again, you know, it. I think that it's a, a I say a testament to uh, your philosophy and the way that you've looked at, you know, wine from a number of different regions, but that, that sensibility in, in terms of how it works with food, um, what it's supposed to, how it's supposed to affect you on the palate, because you've been around long enough, and I think that we both have, where we've seen the tastes of the consumer change and the buyers within within that group. What what are some of the things that you have learned and some of the uh, the funny anecdotes that you've seen over the years uh, that have either made you scratch your head or chuckle? <laughs> you know, it's it's always funny and and the the taste of a wine is in the beholder and and that's why I say I don't make wine for for a, um, you know, for a wine writer, I want that person sitting down with their dinner or with their friends to enjoy that wine. And so, you know, you, you truly never know. I can pour this wine for five people and one of them is going to absolutely hate it. And, you know, I hope one of them is going to absolutely love it and the others will drink it. But you, you never know. And I think the biggest thing in, in your question is that idea of, sweetness and it's been I've been in this business now for 38 years uh, and so it's the idea that uh, people uh, you know say they want it dry but they like a little sweetness in it and I think one of the interesting advantages of making wine in California is we don't have to have sweetness which is uh, residual sugar you know leftover sugar that didn't ferment out in, uh, in the wine in it, but there is an inherent fruitiness that is in our, in our grapes. And, and that's one of the things that, that I want in all four of the wines that I make is I, I want you to taste that grape. I, I want you to know that this is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. It needs to, to taste like, you know, like a Cabernet Sauvignon grape uh, to a degree. And so I want that fruitiness in it but i don't want it to to dominate uh, that wine but it is certainly uh, a great advantage that we have here in california uh with making wine here you know it's uh you know that you mentioned that 
I think there were a lot of growing pains, right? You know, uh, 50 to 40, 30 years ago, not really knowing what your fruit sources were going to give you uh, in terms of uh, California. And when you do inherently understand, or at least begin to understand, it's like, you know, uh, it's like your first child. And then all of a sudden, you know, with subsequent children, you kind of figure out what's going on. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Cabernet for a second. Um, sure. Because it is, you know, uh, certainly one of the, you know, kind of our, uh, our focus uh, of the, uh, the four wines that are made. Where are you sourcing those, for, you know, the, the, the grapes from? Because we're not just dealing with Cabernet, it's a blend, correct? It is. And in the wines, I've made the Cabernet since the 2014 vintage. Uh, I'm working, I'll leave this vineyard here and be in the winery this afternoon uh, working on the 2018 uh, blend. Uh, and I, I, you know, I put a lot of energy and time and effort into this Cabernet. And we generally have four sources of fruit, uh, kind of up and down Napa Valley for three of those uh, to have varying degrees of, of ripeness and warmth. And then we always try to have one of those to be on uh, up in the mountains. Mountain grown fruit is a little different from valley floor fruit. Each one of the Cabernets that I've made uh, has been obviously predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon, mostly 85 to 90%. Uh, but there has always been a little Merlot and always been Cabernet Franc. Cabernet Franc is, is one of my favorite things to, to work with uh, while creating this blend because it's very expressive, has a really kind of purple fruit, uh, violet character. And I don't know if you can tell, but uh, from my glasses, you know, purple works for me, William. Uh, and we'll never and have in, in, in times, you know, in certain vintages, we have also used a little Malbec and occasionally a little bit of, of Petit Verdot. And so this, this uh, blend from four different vineyards and, and potentially five different grape varietals is something that, that I work on very long and, and very hard. And, and as we talked about with clones, it is, uh, has different clonal selections and it has four different specific geographies that add into the complex complexity of that wine. And the first thing that I want from that wine, when I put my nose in the glass is I want it to smell like Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. There are, there is, you know, a number of places that grow Cabernet, uh, but I think Napa Valley is one of those special places and it has a unique aroma. Um, you know, I think in the old days, people called it Rutherford dust. And we certainly work with a vineyard in Rutherford that kind of has that quintessential Napa Valley aroma to it. And so, but because that's the first thing you're going to get is that aroma. And I want it to be Napa Valley. And then the, the palate, I want to be balanced. There's five basic elements that are going in to, to Cabernet. And I need all of those elements in balance. I don't want one of those things to stand out. Oak or alcohol or, or fruit or tannin or acidity. Uh, I want them to work together because I think of the palate, uh, that wine going onto your palate as a ball. And I want that ball to roll down my palate. And I don't want something sticking out and whacking me upside the head uh, every time that it goes by. And, and so creating balance is extremely important to me uh, as a winemaker. And as a chef, it's the same thing in creating a dish. You need a dish that goes together, that melds together, that works and is harmonious in your mouth. And you need the same thing from, from Cabernet. I think there are a lot of very uh, interesting, good uh, versions of Napa Valley Cabernet, but there is a lot of them that are too alcoholic, 15.5% uh, alcohol, and it's just a burn. I think there's some of them that are too extracted, and they've, they've tried to make it too juicy and, and fruity. And there's some that are too tannic. It just it rips your, your mouth out. And so what I want is all those five base elements in it, but not dominated by one. 
And I think that's going to create a more enjoyable wine for you sitting down having dinner tonight at your place in, in Denver uh, or my house in Sonoma or in Tampa, Florida, where somebody else is, is going to drink the wine. And I also think that it's going to help that wine age better because if, if a wine starts out in balance, then I think it's going to end up with a little age in balance. Uh, and that's extremely important to me, William. Oh, true. And, you know, for that reason, I pulled a bottle of 2014 Cabernet out of the cellar. And that's what I'm drinking right now. And, you know, that was the first year where we, you know, we saw the, uh, the droughts uh, in Napa and throughout California. And many of those very ripe, you know, uh, you know very intense uh, Cabernets from the state, you know, tended to have a little bit too much. Uh, this, the acidity is there. It is aged beautifully. It's a delicious wine. Um, it sheds some of, you know, I always talk about shedding baby fat where the tannins, you know, are somewhat angular when they're young. Mm -hmm. You don't get any of that here, uh, but along with the uh, the dark fruit, there's some mocha, you know, because the uh, you know there's a little bit of that you know uh, coffee and chocolate, uh, and I still get just a hint of the 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 notes that we would expect for Cabernet, just a touch of pyrazine and some of the fern and green notes that provide some complexity. It's a really really cool wine. Yeah, it's fun that you pull the 14. As I said, that's the first vintage of Cabernet that I made for rootstock. I, I was, uh, let's see, a uh, weekend before last, I pulled a 2015 to uh, check it out and really was fun because it, as you said, it, like the 14, it had lost some of that baby fat. It was just taking on that bottle maturity complexity, you know, just at the very beginning of that. But what I loved from it from a winemaking standpoint it still had that balance and it still was bright and fresh although you know five years is not old at all for a cabernet but it was taking on some of that you know just uh just taking on those those aged uh characters and it really was fun unfortunately that wine didn't prove to be enough for my very small group of four uh, and so I opened a 17 after that, uh, and it was very fun to compare the two. Three of the four vineyards were the same. Obviously, the winemaker uh, was the same, uh, and the vintage are, are a little different between 15 and, and 17. Right. But again, what I liked about it was there was a similarity, and you could tell that it was was you know, of the same family, but it wasn't the exact same wine. And that's what I was talking about earlier is I'm not trying to make these wines to a mold, to a tradition, you know? I mean, I think there are certain Napa Valley Cabernets that, that are trying to make exactly the same thing year in and year out. And I'm not doing that. I, I uh, don't want to manipulate that wine uh, to the point that I, I use natural yeast fermentation. I don't uh, ever in any of these wines inoculate for secondary fermentation. That wine's going to go through secondary fermentation on its own. Then I want it to do that. Um, we don't use any additives. We're not using uh, fermentation aids or anything. I want those grapes to grow up to be the wine that they want to be uh, and, and not try to make something. And so... Uh, it's fun for me to see those vintage variations are truly what that that vineyard and that vintage is giving us. But with the consistency of sourcing, there is a consistency of, of style uh, within that wine. But the 14 that you have there, the 15 and 17 that I had 10 days ago are not exactly the same wine, but they certainly are. Uh, kin to each other and I think that's that's fun for me and I think that's more fun for the for the consumer is to see what that vineyard and what that vintage is not what I want it to be right that's why we talk vintages you know if we wanted if we wanted something like that we would just drink coca-cola you know a formulaic uh, approach <laughs> it's, to making wine yep, and, it's and the same all the time yeah, Bombay gin tastes like Bombay gin every day. Uh, Budweiser <laughs> tastes like Budweiser every day. That's not what we're making here. We're making a really unique, fun, exciting, 
agricultural product that that changes every day uh, in that in that uh, on that grapevine as it is in this vineyard today, as it does during fermentation, as it does during uh, barrel aging, and as it does in the bottle. And that's what's so fun about it is that that change and that that evolution and being able to to watch it. So that's really the secret, William, is you got to buy more than one bottle so that you can see it now and, and then, you know, try it uh, a few months or, you know, a year from now. Good advice if I ever heard any. <laughs> <laughs> That's my sales pitch for the day. <laughs> so is there anything that, you know, in closing, uh, is there anything that you want to tell, you know, uh, everyone out there, um, you know, anything uh, that's, that, that's new apart from, you know, uh, looking at the 18s and blending, um, you know, anything exciting on the horizon? There are a few exciting things. The first and most exciting for those of you outside of the winemaking world is that we are in the process of redesigning the, the label and the packaging for this wine. We're about oh, a little over halfway, two thirds of the way through that process. And it won't be too long now before uh, you see that. We're bottling the 18 Cabernet and the 19 Pinot Noir at the end of July. And those will be the first two wines with that new package. And we're very excited about it. Uh, uh, I am a distant member of the design uh, committee. Uh, and so I get to see the iterations and weigh in very slightly on those. Uh, and it's very exciting. But with that also, uh, talking about these next bottlings, the blend that we're working on for the 18 Cabernet is so fun. I'm really enjoying putting that wine together. The 19 Pinot Noir uh, is, uh, has been in barrel, uh, probably will come out of barrel in the not too distant future so it doesn't get uh, too oaky. Uh, and that wine has a very consistent vineyard source and is really a beautiful uh, expression of Sonoma Coast Pinot Noir. Not heavy, it's, it's kind of a light, uh, in color and silky and complex and fun. So I look forward to getting those wines in the bottle that uh, people will get out in their market uh, in the next, you know, hopefully 12 months or so, William. Well, if we, if we buy more than one bottle, I think we'll get there. Good if, advice. Knows, I like we're that. We're going to consume them in this uh, time of social distancing. If they're as delicious yeah. as they have been under your watch, uh, I don't think there's a there's an issue with uh, sitting at home and drinking a few bottles. Well, now remember, social distancing is from everyone else. It is not social distancing from your bottle of wine. So load up, <laughs> drink well, eat well, and everyone out there, stay healthy. Thanks, William. You got it, my man. And thanks again for everybody listening. Thanks for the questions. Um, check in with us tomorrow when we talk to Michael Brakovic for Kumio River on the other side of the world. So uh, take a look for that on the uh, IG Live. And if you didn't get all of this, uh, you know, take a look at the IG TV where we'll have a, a full recording a little bit later on. So thanks again, Vance. Really appreciate this. This is awesome. And uh, can't wait to see you soon, man. Can't wait to see you soon. Thanks for having me, William. See you later. You too. Bye, guys. Stay safe out there.